Well, good morning and good evening to our audience, both in India and United States and other part of the world. Uh, we have a panel of eminent leaders who have had experience both in India, U.S. diplomacy. And the topic of our discussion is India, U.S. natural partners. The question also is, is how do we realize the full potential of this partnership as we look at a win-win scenario between the two countries. Uh, we have India, which is rising, but at the same time, due to COVID, has its challenges. We have U.S., which is moving forward with the vaccination diplomacy, and the economy, which is almost a $23 trillion economy, expected to grow between 65 to 7% this year. The trade between the two countries is around $143 billion, shrank a bit due to COVID. But what we are seeing last three months, that the momentum is picking up, almost $9 billion trade every month for the last three months. And what we are seeing also FDI investment into India from the U.S. have been unprecedented in the sense they're up already by 19%. So what we are seeing is a tremendous momentum picking up, but we have challenges. We have U.S. leaving Afghanistan, the implication on India, and you have China, which is constantly poking at India with its border itself. So on that note, once again, welcome, and I'm going to invite Ambassador Ken Juster to give his opening remarks. Ambassador? Well, thank you very much, Mukesh, and thank you for all of your tremendous work in advancing the U.S.-India relationship over the years. You've been a key player in that regard, and it's a pleasure to be here this morning with such a distinguished panel. I thought I could try to give a little context for the discussion today. Uh, it is true that there are challenges on a regular basis in the relationship, but if you step back and look at the progress from 2000 when we started to transform U.S.-Indian relations to today, it's really remarkable. We work across the board on virtually every issue of human endeavor. Uh, clearly, one of the key areas of cooperation has been in defense and counterterrorism, uh, where we've now signed enabling agreements to enable us to work together on uh, very critical missions and share sensitive information. Uh, but we've also worked together on health. We've worked uh, uh, throughout the years with India in a health partnership that played a key role also in dealing with some of the challenges of COVID. Uh, the economic relationship has continued to grow over the years. Uh, when I first got involved in the U.S. India relationship in 2001, we had about 16 or $18 billion in bilateral trade. As you said, Mukesh, we hit about $146 billion right before COVID, and we've recovered quite quickly back up to 143 with a greater projected trade. But as I'll comment in a section, in a second, uh, in a minute, that is still a pillar that I think is underdeveloped. Uh, uh, we work on science and technology, energy, the environment, uh, uh, education, agriculture, uh, space, oceans, really across the board on issues. And you've seen this go from administration to administration, whether it's Democratic or Republic on the American side, and from administration to administration on the Indian side. This has been a a, a relationship that has had strong support uh, across the board from all political uh, parties uh, and has really continued to thrive and, and advance forward. And I think the new administration has picked up uh, where we left off in the last administration. Next week, Secretary Blinken is planning to travel to India. I believe he leaves on Monday uh, evening. And uh, this is the third cabinet level interaction between the two. Already they've had a virtual summit of the Quad leaders, uh, India, the United States, Japan, and Australia. They plan to have an in-person Quad meeting later this year, as well as what's known as a two plus two ministerial with the defense and uh, foreign ministers of both countries to really tackle a range of issues in their latest uh, statement. They spoke of cooperation on health and COVID vaccines uh, in the area of climate change and on a critical and emerging technology. So I would say the relationship is very strong and continues to grow. It will have challenges uh, along the way. There's no doubt about it. And dealing with the 
rise of China in the region and, and globally is uh, going to be one of the central challenges for the United States, India, and the region uh, at large. And as I mentioned, I think an area of uh, tremendous potential still, and one that I know this audience is interested in, is the economic relationship and trade and investment. And uh, this is critical, especially coming out of COVID. Uh, for India, having a strong economy is important, not just to provide jobs to a relatively young population, but also uh, to modernize its military and to be able to be a key player in the region by providing assistance to neighboring countries so that there's not a vacuum left for other countries uh, to fill. India is going to have to make a decision as to what it would like to do in terms of trade. Uh, it uh, withdrew from the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership Agreement. Uh, it has been disappointed with some of its free trade agreements. And I hope the lesson coming out of COVID is not that you have to close your borders and try to do everything internally. And people have spoken of decreasing critical uh, dependencies, but that you have to really have a circle of trusted partners that you can work with more extensively. And I would feel that the United States would be at the top of that list of trusted partners with India. And that means really across the board on defense issues, but on economic issues. And my hope is that the two countries can continue to try to resolve outstanding economic issues. We tried to reach a small trade deal, but ran into some roadblocks. Hopefully something of that nature can be done. Uh, in addition, uh, well, I think it may not be easy to do a bilateral free trade agreement in the near future. One of the real geostrategic opportunities, and it's a big idea, and I know there are a lot of domestic uh, problems potentially with doing this, but would have the United States and India accede to the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement. That would be a big geostrategic step that would enable uh, both countries to really uh, be active economically uh, in this region and help set the standards uh, for issues such as how to deal with the digital economy uh, for 5G and other things of that uh, nature. So I would say that the relationship is strong. Uh, there are challenges ahead, but it's continued to grow. It's uh, supported across the board uh, in both countries. It's got a huge people-to-people -people foundation uh, that's been very critical. There are over 4 million Indian Americans in the United States, 200,000 uh, Indians uh, study in the United States at any one time. Uh, and so there's a very vibrant relationship among our peoples, which provides, again, a strong foundation for the broader efforts between our countries. And I would just like to see greater ballast to the business relationship, more trade and investment. Uh, I think uh, again, an opening again in both countries uh, to this, and I think that would really uh, round out all of the other issues. But again, a very critical partnership strategically uh, in the Indo-Pacific as we try to establish an architecture to support the principles of a free and open Indo-Pacific region that uh, honors free trade and open skies and uh, freedom of navigation and uh, overflight and the like. And so I think this is a critical partnership for the 21st century and one that certainly, uh, as I indicated, is getting the attention of leaders in both countries. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador Jester. Uh, I, I also wanted to thank you for your leadership and service. Uh, I think the relationship since you were in India has really risen up and uh, and you know the amount of energy you put in if i recall you have visited almost every state and every union territory you don't need to put the word almost in there i uh, know <laughs> you have <laughs> well I thank have you. two union territories in this visit uh, uh which are not on the mainland uh, uh but i've otherwise been to every state and six of the union territories Thank you once again. Uh, let me invite uh, uh, Sanjay to give his opening remarks. Thank you. Good evening and good morning to all of you. Ambassador Jester has given a very comprehensive view about the overall relationship between economic, strategic, and with his vast experience and his tenure in India. And I 
recall happily the time is spent with him both in calcutta and also the reception in delhi and he has given a wide gamut of the issues and the challenges ahead but more than that the potential and the possibilities what the two great countries can do together taking the point from both of you the, our relationship both in economic terms say our current trade in terms of <clears throat> goods and services which is currently hovering around us dollar 143 billion how do we take it to us dollar 500 billion if we talk in economic perspective because there could not be a better time when our minister mr jayashankar he visited us and in return we have secretary of state coming here next week and this is the third visit as has been mentioned earlier i think with the people to people contact with our students studying there and more than that i remember always one thing that the best of friends and the best of relationship come in the worst of times and there could not be worse than the pandemic what all of us have gone through both in terms of loss to human life loss of economic activity but during this tough times us and india have shown their resilience they have shown the partnership we could do together both in terms of supply of raw material vaccine and you know that could be lead to a long term partnership i'm talking in terms of economic we basically in pharma in medicines india and the us with a lot of medicines and pharma used to happen but i think this is one big area in economic terms where we could have a very long strategic partnership ambassador has covered other areas basically on energy climate artificial intelligence and there are vast areas well, in terms of the security and all that where india and us have worked together and we will work it in a much larger gambit i would like to touch upon the topic of the gsp which was also subject of our discussion here the generalized system of preference and coming from trade i would like to clarify whether you know the gsp going forward maybe at some time with ambassadors being there also uh, whatever material was coming to us under gsp basically that was helping the us imports being competitive about two third of imports under gsp was basically either raw material intermediary goods or components which was making us manufacturing more competitive and particularly more for medium and small enterprises and the value of the duties which was saved by us companies in gsp was ranging about 750 million then it was about 900 million but there of course there is some kind of you know trade fiction going forward naturally us also needs market access on different things and that as they say we can agree to disagree but the continuous dialogue which is happening now as it mentioned here with the bilateral visits i am sure those issues are resolving and gradually we will see much more and deepened relationship between the two countries and then gsp may be reinstated at some time which could further give a much larger boost to our economic relationship so i would think that is, there cannot be a better time when we can take this relationship to a much much higher level and there is a deep interest also you mentioned about it, different geographies so if we can talk openly i think the current relationship between india and us also will have some kind of you know um, what is happening with our other competitors or as we can say with china particularly because there is a kind of feeling that us in india will have much larger role to play there is a tendency to do less and less i am also experiencing practically that more and more companies want to do business with the indian companies now and they want to shift business they want to tilt towards india so again this could be a wonderful time for indian companies also to expand and for us companies also who want to shift waste from china or either for production or in terms of sourcing so coming from a business background coming from the practical experience i can only vouch and reaffirm that we cannot have a better time than this thank you so much thank you sanjay and uh, we'll definitely come back to you on gsp i just want to uh, mention that the goods which come under the category of gsp have had the fastest growth during covid time between india and the us itself so so we will we'll definitely come back to that let me uh, invite uh, nagaraja to give his opening remarks i'm just conscious of the time so that's why uh, it's important that uh, we just try to uh, stay within the time go ahead nagaraj good morning good evening everyone thank you for horizon um, setting up this uh, important uh, meeting 
in this juncture. And uh, thank you, Muke, for your leadership. And thank you, Ambassador Khan and the distinguished panel. Um, I'll have a, a background um, 25 years back in India, 25 years in the U.S. So I, I lived that part of the U.S., I would say, working in the U.S. in the financial services industry. I'm based in the New York, and I live in New Jersey. <clears throat> um, these two states, you see predominantly the Indians working uh, in various financial sectors, as well as the technology. And my experience working in the Silicon Valley in the early 2000 before the dot-com bubble. So I have experience um, evolving relationships in the business side. Uh, but I believe, as uh, Ambassador and uh, Mukesh and uh, <coughs> Sandeep, they mentioned about how the relationship has established. So I leave the, the geopolitical uh, dialogue to the, the political side. Rather, I just focus on the business side. <coughs> so I see the, the greater opportunity, both in the business side, from attracting the foreign direct investment to India, from the U.S. Uh, business operations, <clears throat> um, both in the financial sector as well as in the technology space. Uh, when we look at uh, the Indian administration point of view from uh, the statements from the next five years to 10 years from the economy from $2.5 trillion to grow to the $5 trillion to $10 trillion, uh, the Indian Moonshot Initiative, if you look at the 10 years horizon, is to reach a $10 trillion GDP. So how do we achieve that? If you if you bring the each state in India, uh, if they can generate a trillion dollar each, like how the US, United States does, like in the New York and the East Coast, literally generates 1.5 to 1.8 trillion dollar. And in the Texas, I believe they, just in Dallas, if you go to the airport, the signboards all over, it says by 2045, they want to become a $1 trillion economy. So I think, the India should take that the direction from individual states to to promote, and I have seen that in early 2020 coming to the Davos as a speaker, and I have seen one or two states coming in, and uh, uh, the Indian leadership was presented there. But I I don't see very aggressive. I think that's the one area where you can promote um, industries uh, bringing to the U.S. The other part is the academia, where in the last 20, 30, or 40 years, um, the number of uh, uh, thought leaderships who has become leaders in the U.S. education system, now deans of the business schools, uh, but I don't see the transition from that education knowledge to the Indian uh, education systems. I think that's a greater opportunity to build the relationships. Um, uh, so I'll, I'll stop there because I see you know other speakers would like to jump in and share their views. Uh, but as we continue, I'll share more. Thank you. Thank you, uh, thank you, Nagaraja. And I think uh, we'll definitely talk about the vision of ten trillion dollar economy. Let me move on to uh, uh, Sandy Clement. Uh, early morning for you in LA, and uh, at the same time, uh, the potential of uh, Hollywood and Bollywood partnership, and, and projecting India. Uh, as a soft power, uh, uh, and Bollywood has taken that lead itself. So, Sandy, over to you. You know, it's wonderful to hear the geopolitical and macroeconomic viewpoints, and I'm just here to remind you that perhaps the best diplomacy is storytelling. And in some ways, you know, the news and social media have uh, corrupted our ability to communicate with each other uh, because it turns things into sound bites and stereotypes, where storytelling is really how we bring people together, how we promote cooperation, how instead of it looking at a distance and, and unfamiliar and perhaps uh, not comfortable, we make people comfortable with each other. And in the world that we're on today, we are on a global platform. Entertainment is a global platform just as Politics, just as economics, is a global platform today. And the most exciting thing is these two worlds of creativity coming together. So in Bollywood, you've had this, this history, this rich history of entertainment, storytelling. And the reality is that we are now creating local language product for a global market. And where we, you know, when I was growing up, um, in the Bronx, in New York, if you had a 
subtitled film. It would play possibly, possibly in one theater in New York. And if it was a very special product, it might play in Los Angeles as well. Today, we turn on all of our streaming services. And what we are watching is product from India, from the Middle East, from Latin America, you know, all with subtitles, all genuine, reminding us that the hopes, the dreams, the aspirations, that while things are localized, the way families, relationships, the way we look at the world is very much uh, the same. And I think that as we move forward, the greatest hope for these two extraordinarily important partners and economies, the natural partners that they are, is that the partnership and creativity will lead to really the partnership that we need to stabilize this world, to have the two largest democracies in the world um, reinforce the sense of how people live in freedom, how they cooperate with each other, how we have uh, intellectual property exchange, but more so human exchange between India and the U.S., Thank you. Uh, thank you, Sandy. And uh, it's important to, uh, you know, as you said, uh, have a story uh, telling between the two countries. And I'll, and I'll come back to you because one of the questions I have for you, it would be is, as Bollywood and Hollywood starts merging together, how do you deal with the cultural aspect uh, of the two countries also? But we'll come back to you. Ram, over to you. Thank you. I um, appreciate the opportunity to share my perspective. Uh, unlike other panelists, my uh, lens that which I'm viewing this partnership is from the perspective of uh, the digital partnership between U.S. and India. Um, so we are at this unique point uh, where I feel India is representing a very attractive market for global companies, let alone U.S. companies, whether it's Facebook, Google, Microsoft, Intel, or startups like the one that I run and manage. Uh, it's a huge opportunity for us. Uh, let me st share some statistics that we, you may be aware of. Uh, more than a billion Indians will have access to a smart smartphone by 2024. Um, COVID has only accelerated that. Um, close to 600 million Indians already use 4G data. Per capita, uh, Indians represent the most data consumed anywhere in the world. Uh, thanks to uh, service providers here, the low data rates available in the country has facilitated this. Um, so I feel like for the development and the future of technologies like AI, cybersecurity, blockchain, um, the India's data market is a huge uh, and critical importance for everyone. Uh, American companies have invested continuously. American venture capitalists have invested in the country, and they've continued to kind of push the startup economy in the country. Um, you know, tech entrepreneurs with H-1B visas uh, have forced the uh, startup ecosystems to succeed. And the foundation is there for this, uh, the digital side of this partnership between the world's two largest democracy, democracies. Um, however, this partnership needs a more formalized strategy. It requires some sort of official intervention. And the differences over treatment and access to data is where we see uh, friction. And I think there is an opportunity for us to discuss and potentially lay some groundwork in that regard. So I'm sure we'll discuss more as we go through this panel. And thanks for the opportunity again. Rob, thank you very much. And, uh, uh, you know, data is a big, big issue between the two countries, especially the recent uh, banning of MasterCard, what kind of message yeah. it sends. Uh, but I'll come back to you. Let me uh, ask my first question to the ambassador. You know, you have been pivotal in trying to make sure that India-U.S. signs all the agreement on the Quad. And, and the Quad Alliance seems to be moving in the right direction. Do you see, from your perspective, what would be the short-term, mid-term uh, success of definition for Quad partnership? You're on mute. Okay. Yeah. I just gave a great answer. I hope you heard it. <laughs> Please okay. repeat that. <laughs> you want me to repeat it? Okay, I'll do it in a bit uh, slower and lengthier. Okay. Uh, the Quad has been a very important and significant development 
It originated in 2004 at the time of the tsunami and the four countries, India, Japan, Australia, and the United States, four democracies worked together on humanitarian assistance and disaster relief. Uh, and it unfortunately, uh, the Chinese were not pleased about the Quad. They viewed it as a sort of way to contain China, which was not what it was uh, originally designed for. And uh, the Quad fell out of use in about 2008. And we made a concerted effort to try to resurrect that. We had meetings at the uh, assistant secretary level, and eventually we had two ministerial meetings, uh, including in 2019 during the UN General Assembly in New York and 2020, October 2020 in Tokyo, where in person the foreign ministers of the four countries, and now the Biden administration has had a virtual summit in March of this year, and is, uh, we've been discussing and planning to have a in-person summit later this year. Uh, the Quad is now initially working on and working groups on COVID vaccines in the areas of emerging and critical technologies and on climate change. But I expect it to continue to expand its activities. It's worked also on maritime domain security. Uh, it is not designed to be a military alliance. Uh, I think that's something the Indians would be concerned about because they don't want to send a message to China that there is some uh, effort to militarily gang up or contain China. But this group will be critical in terms of continuing to find areas to cooperate on and build out the architecture of the Indo-Pacific region. And they don't need to just work among themselves. They can have other countries join in. It's a flexible arrangement. They had during COVID informal coordination with uh, Korea. Uh, I believe they've had issues with Vietnam uh, as well and uh, even Israel and, and, and countries out of the region uh, can cooperate with them also. But it's really intended to expand the areas of cooperation, including, as I said, in the maritime uh, domain, which is critical to uh, India and the Indian Ocean region and to the countries of the Pacific uh, as well. If they could cooperate on things such as 5G technology, artificial intelligence, the digital economy, that would be fantastic. In other words, I threw out the big idea of a accession to the Trans-Pacific Partnership, but even if you get these four countries to tackle some of the critical emerging technology and trade issues and standard setting, that would be very significant as well. So it's going to have a flexible structure. They're not clear milestones, but it's to continue to elevate the coordination, perhaps at some point to institutionalize or normalize these meetings and arrangements, and to really, as I said, try to build out the architecture for a free and open Indo-Pacific. Thank you. And uh, Ambassador, you bring a valid point. When you look at the four economies, they're almost $33 trillion economies combined and growing at a fast pace. And, and so we see a lot of synergy uh, of economic cooperation under the Quad. Uh, that may be more of a logical way to align India with the U.S. and uh, Japan and Australia to pursue much more economic interests. And I think uh, we've seen a lot of stuff happening, especially on the economic partnership. Let me, uh, let me uh, go to Sanjay. Sanjay, you talked about uh, GSP. GSP. And we talked about, we talked about uh, issues. And... Uh, how critical is GSP? Because without the GSP, uh, the export from India are still growing. They're the fastest growing uh, under the category. So uh, from your perspective, is GSP still important for India or you want to move on from an India perspective? No, definitely we are moving on. And as you rightly said, exports are increasing and it will definitely increase. But if GSP comes in, it can accelerate it much faster. But I'm not saying that if GSP is not reinstated, it is going to hamper or dampen the split of the enterprise between the two countries. And as I said earlier, the relationship has to grow and grow faster. So if GSP comes in, it will be multiplying in a different direction on a faster speed. But that is, having said that, it doesn't mean that if GSP is not happening immediately, the relationship will come to a halt. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Nagraj, you talked about uh, a 10 trillion dollar economy. And uh, in our estimate, 
Uh, India needs roughly $100 billion FDI on an annual basis for next 10 years to achieve that objective of uh, a $10 tr- uh, trillion dollar economy. But, and that means uh, if you want to have that investment, you've got to lower barriers for international companies coming into India. You've got to create a sense of transparency. You've got to create, bring in a level playing field. What we are seeing is in the last 12 months, a lot of barriers are going up. And how do you basically attract FDI into India while maintaining or raising the barriers? Thank you. Uh, that's a very interesting question. Uh, it's, it's a monumental to solve the problem in, in the next 10 years. Uh, but I quote the, uh, the president, JFK Kennedy, 50, 60 years back when he mentioned about the moonshot initiative because we choose to go to the moon uh, because it's difficult to do and we do the other things. Uh, so the, from the Indian uh, government, uh, the Prime Minister Modi's uh, agenda for the next 10 years, how we wanted to take the economy to the next level. So we need to have a direction and a strategy. Uh, U.S. is definitely is the much larger um, economy, uh, but at the same time, the India should also focus on the Europe and other countries. Um, individual states, uh, I come from the southern state in uh, Telugu state, speaking Hyderabad. Um, and, and when I see Hyderabad predominantly in the last 20, 25 years in the IT sector, the pharma industry, uh, and and uh, when I interact with the chief minister from Tamil Nadu or, or in, in Maharashtra, uh, each state want to build their own $1 trillion economies in the next five to 10 years. So they're aggressively focusing on coming to the U.S. and the U.S. markets and interact with the ambassador to the U.S. as well as um, uh, Indian consulate generals to, to build that ecosystem. Uh, but I think one aspect which I would like to uh, share and raise that issue is in the last 20 years, uh, except the IT industries, none of the industries are focused uh, in India. Uh, in in the last 20 years, the IT revenues in India is around 180 to 200 billion dollars. That is 10 percent of the overall India's economy. That is a 2.5 trillion dollars. If you want to go to the next five ten years, the 10 trillion dollar economy, that IT itself is has to grow 10 times more, but the other industries has to move also. I think uh, the, as your point of view, the foreign direct investment, FDIs, uh, India should attract and uh, they should be more, uh, the, the government regulations from both the countries has to be lifted uh, to streamline and also the Indian businesses to, to visit and come to um, you know, areas of opportunity growth in the US and the Europe and to see invest directly and interact with the business houses here, uh, that will open the doors and uh, the bilateral trade, I believe, obviously, uh, from Ambassador's point of view, you need to open the doors much wider. Thank you, Raj. You talked about uh, IT services, and I have been a strong believer while India spends a lot of energy trying to get the make in India manufacturing growing, its strength is still services, uh, the, the human talent, the creativity, Absolutely. and 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 uh, and I think that's where Sandy. My question comes to you: is is how do you leverage uh, Bollywood and Hollywood uh, on, on the media side, uh, on the entertainment side, and and at the same time, how do you manage the culture a- culture aspect? You know, some of the productions of uh, Netflix ran into uh, you know from the censor board in India. Or whereas in the U.S. would be fine, but in India it would be seen differently. So how do you basically balance uh, the cultural aspect of two countries while you're trying to grow uh, the services sector in the entertainment arena? Well, well let me start with the, 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 the non-entertainment answer, which is that with foreign direct investment in India, we, we, we really do need to have enormous collaboration between these two economies and more. We actually need to actually open up the world and, and, and India and the U.S. Should, should lead that. On the U.S. side, we should be revisiting our, you know, this, this sort of nationalistic trend of, of our contracting our immigration policies. When you, th- you, when you think about 
the intellectual capital that has come from India because of the strength of the educational system, of the infrastructure, the mentoring, the value that has been shifted. You know, I look at my friend Ram Shuram, who worked on Mosaic, created Jungli, which is Amazon's uh, uh, engine, uh, search engine, and then, you know, was the first president of Google because these two young students came to him and said, you know, you can't understand business and search, and we're doing this search thing, and that's Google. And you think about the power of the sort of collaboration um, cross-border in technology, and that also needs to happen in terms of entertainment. And the, the reality is that when you move to a global platform in entertainment, and, and India is no different than any other country, uh, in my opinion, just my opinion, um, those companies, you if you want to call them Hollywood-centric companies that are global, but any Hollywood company, we respect cultural norms all over the world. If you go to Scandinavia, um, you actually will have um, sort of sexually provocative um, material that is looked at as healthy di dialogue that we would probably not allow in the U.S., I would argue inconsistently, whereas we allow enormous amounts of violence in our entertainment, which is banned in Scandinavia. What we do by sort of doing cultural exchanges, we, we don't bring the world together to change cultures. We bring the world together to have dialogue around culture. And the reality is that India has been an enormous leader, as the U.S. has been, in the, the dialogue that we just had on the digital economy. The more we move to mobile, the more we move to a digital economy, the more the models in India, the models in the United States converge in terms of how they serve the customer, how they treat communities of interest, how we make lives easier and better for people in each country and around the world with the models that we have. How we basically have them collaborate with each other is both political, economic, and cultural. And the sensitivities of all three need to be brought to bear for the right balance for that collaboration to happen. Thank you, uh, Sandy, for your comprehensive answer. Uh, let me reach out, uh, ask Ram. Ram, you talked about data being critical. Uh, data is going to drive the economy. And uh, at the same time, we have almost a billion uh, smartphone users in India. But what we're seeing is there's no clear policy uh, from government of India on data localization. You saw recently, because MasterCard was delayed in trying to submit this audit report, uh, they were banned. Yeah. And uh, you have to understand, there's more data flows from U.S. into India than from India to the U.S. So the question uh, I have for you is, is how do you basically work out a policy which protects data in India, but at the same time do, does not send a wrong message to multinational companies who are interested in investing in India that you will be banned if you miss or have a misstep itself? Yeah, no, that's a very good point. Um, so there are two aspects here. One is around data localization, which is limiting the data that's generated in country and storing it within country. And the second one is access to the data. Uh, and, you know, with, with respect to the current policy, uh, India has a very restrictive uh, uh, approach to both localization and, uh, and access. Um, I think your point is absolutely right. In order to support the growth, uh, we need to take a lead on articulating and legislating cross-border data flow uh, so key economies can exchange um, uh, exchange information and data. Um, so I think what's lacking currently is a data protection legislation that promotes open and freer exchange of data across borders that is consistent with uh, international norms. Um, I think there is a there is a technology problem which can be easily uh, there is a technology problem around you know how to implement and how to do this. Um, but there is also and that's the easy part. But the harder part, and I don't know, I don't have an answer for this. Maybe this group has an answer. Is the political one, which is you know uh, legislation and and making the legislators aware of how to do it right. No, which is true, and and you know the value of data is when it flows cross border, 
And if yeah. you balkanize it, then it loses its value. So let me let me come to uh, Ambassador, and I know I'm conscious of our time also. Uh, Ambassador, when you look at the one action which India needs to take, I know there are a lot of action we can talk about, but one critical action India needs to take, and also the U.S. also needs to take, to basically drive this relation to to the next level is so, be it economic, geopolitical, or student exchange, or H-1B, or whatever it is. So what would be your advice to, and this is, you're not speaking as the ambassador, you're speaking as an individual uh, citizen itself. So what would be your advice to the government of India and the U.S. government itself? I think once an ambassador, you're always an ambassador. So I <laughs> will continue to have that hat in part. Uh, there are many different things that uh, are on the horizon that the countries could do together. I threw out the big idea of acceding to the Trans-Pacific Partnership because I think that has an important geo-strategic component to it, not just a trade component. In fact, I think the geo-strategy is even more important, how it brings both India and the United States into a trade arrangement in the region of the Indo-Pacific. It helps them set standards and really integrate the countries uh, in that uh, partnership. But that's a big step, and it may be tough politically. On a smaller scale, I think what we were just referring to, the United States and India have vibrant technology sectors, and whether it relates to uh, what's been discussed and the opportunities between Hollywood and Bollywood, but they need to come together on the rules of the digital economy. I mean, right now, as has been mentioned, India is sort of closing itself to the flow of data And that's going to come back to bite them if they do that. They have uh, significant uh, technology services companies that depend on getting data back and forth from the United States. And so I think they need to work out a way, yes, to take into account legitimate public policy concerns such as privacy, but that doesn't mean you can't have a flow of data. You could also figure out how to monetize data, which I know is something of interest to folks in India because they have a great deal of data. But you still have to work out a way to let it flow back and forth so that our technology sectors and the sectors that technology drives, including financial services, entertainment, and others, can benefit from the expertise and uh, everything that the two countries has to offer. So at least discuss the digital economy issues and the technology flows, but think about some big step that could open up trade, help the economies, and advance the situation geostrategically in the region. Thank you, Ambassador. Uh, Sanjay, we talked about data. Uh, it's important for both countries, but value data is, is cross-border flow. Uh, from your perspective, when you look at uh, on the GSP and the trade uh, aspect, what would be your recommendation to the government of India and the U.S.? on one thing each one of them should focus on, trying to enhance this relationship? I think first and foremost is now our visit to each other is very, very important overdue. When for myself, it has been about two years when I had to in the U.S. meet my customers there, meet my friends, and meet my exporters. And same thing from U.S. to India, because until then, this thing is believing. When we have our friends from the U.S. coming to our plants, when they see it, they have a different impression altogether. And as I mentioned earlier, this uh, partnership and the relationship only has to grow bigger and better. And as you rightly said, that what one thing should be done immediately with ambassadors help there, that how soon we can start, you know, flying to into the other countries. That will really help and solve many of the misnomers and many of the misunderstandings or misinformation which we might have. And as I mentioned earlier, both are looking to grow the relationship and people want to keep the basis there. And that is one thing you know, where we must catch on and build on. I hope, uh, hope hopefully soon you'll start seeing borders opening uh, between the two countries. And now, Raja, from your perspective, uh, when we look at uh, uh, U.S.-India relationship, what would be your one advice to both government to focus on and enhance this partnership? Uh, thank you. Uh, Ambassador uh, Ken, uh, I just mentioned about open the, the boundaries, even though we need to protect our intellectual property and the IP, but at the same time, the information show information flow should be 
uh, you know, opened up rather than bridging the barriers and, and curtail those relationships. I think the, as, as the panel shared the experience, it's a national partnership between the US and India. If you wanted to build that culture and also the transparency and the, and the, the governance, I think we need to open more rather than bridging the barriers there. So I think that's key. Thank you. Uh, uh, Sandy, from your perspective, what would be your recommendation, uh, you know, be it on data side or as you mentioned, H1B, one recommendation it would make to government of India and the U.S. to pursue? I think the issues that India is dealing with in, in terms of data and security is, is, is also an issue for the U.S. It is complex. We are living in a world right now where um, everything can be monitored and we are balancing security concerns, privacy concerns, and the ability to sort of bring people into this world that services them. And the reality is, if I had one recommendation, it's that instead of fighting over data, that we actually sit down and discuss these issues in a, a collaborative sense, because the solution for one country will help inform the solution of the other. Thank you. Ram, uh, your sure. perspective? I think we're trying to do a one-size-fits-all solution uh, for everything, and I don't think that's going to work for data. What I recommend is uh, a specific bilateral sort of relationship between India and U.S. around data sharing, much along the lines of uh, there's an act called the Cloud Act, much along the lines of that, which could reduce trade friction, resolve conflict of laws, and harmonize law enforcement. Thank you. I am uh, out of time here, and uh, I wish you had more time because this is a fantastic uh, discussion with experienced people. And so I just want to say uh, uh, thank you to Ambassador Jester, Sanjay, Nagaraja, Sandy, and Ram. Uh, once again, thank you once again what you do for both countries. I think it's important uh, as citizens, as professionals, we keep on driving because the potential of this relationship is going to change the world itself and benefits both countries. So once again, thank you. I wish you a wonderful day and we'll be in touch. Thank you. Thank you, Mukesh. Appreciate everything you did. Brilliant, brilliant moderation and a great panel. Thank you. Thank you.